Hello and welcome to Still Behind the Bench. My name is Adam and on this channel I will attempt to describe the science behind distilling spirits in a more technical way. Hopefully it will whet your appetite to learn more and teach you enough so that you're more self-sufficient. So for this video I'm going to continue talking about fermentation but I will be focusing more on nutrients. Hopefully by the end of this video series you'll be able to answer what is fermentation, what is needed for a healthy fermentation, and what can cause a stalled fermentation. Let's get started. Now that we know what fermentation is, we can look at what is needed for a healthy fermentation and what can cause a stalled fermentation. So what do we need for a fermentation? Well, we need the yeast itself, we need proper environmental conditions, we need water, which is the medium that the yeast will live in. It's also used for chemical reactions and it's used as a transport mechanism by dissolving the carbon source and nutrients so they're available to the yeast. We'll need a carbon source or feedstock, which is for the yeast to ferment and eat. And in five, we need nutrients. These are required for a healthy functioning yeast for it to be able to metabolize the carbon source and use it to both live and ferment. We'll start with the yeast itself and environmental conditions. If you're using a yeast meant for distilling, the ideal environmental conditions will typically be on the label somewhere or on the manufacturer's website. And by ideal environmental conditions, I mean the temperature and pH ranges. The temperature will likely fall between 15 degrees Celsius and 37 degrees Celsius, or 60 Fahrenheit and 99 Fahrenheit. I myself typically ferment at 24 degrees Celsius or 75 Fahrenheit, as I have a room that pretty much sits at that temperature all year round. The pH requirement will typically fall between 4.5 and 5.5, and if you've watched my video on pH, you'll know I typically set my pH at 4.8 for various reasons. Remember, these are ideal ranges and I wouldn't strive too far outside of them. pH can and most likely will change during fermentation. So if you're doing a short sugar wash, it'll probably not be around long enough for the pH to crash completely. But the pH in sugar washes does typically fall quite quickly as the yeast pump out organic acids. So if you're using sucrose as an adjunct ingredient to a grain mash, you may need to keep your eye on the pH as it can cause the fermentation to stall. Same with uh, a molasses wash for a rum. For temperature, dropping outside of the temperature range can also cause the fermentation to slow down or stall, especially on the higher end. If it's going into a room that is typically too cold, maybe wrap the blanket around the vessel loosely. If it's too hot, you may want to drop ice into the container or move it into a cooler area. With the water itself, the osmotic stress video went into detail on high gravity versus low gravity and why you should or shouldn't have them. If you're just going to use tap water, you may want to print out the water chemistry spec sheet from your local water treatment facility so you can get an idea of what's already in there. If there is a lot of chlorine, which is not so likely these days as most treatment facilities have moved to chloramine instead as it's more persistent, you can actually just let the water sit open to the air and the chlorine will evaporate away within a few hours, especially if you use hotter water to begin with. If it is chloramine you're dealing with, then you can add Camden tablets, which is sodium or potassium metabisulfite, and it will counteract any chloramine that's in the water. I'm going to talk in detail about water chemistry in an upcoming video though. Having straight sugar as the only carbon source isn't healthy for yeast. It's like eating McDonald's all the time. In yeast it can trigger hormone-like effects and it can stifle cell stress responses. So you can end up with more off flavors and congeners using a straight simple sugar like glucose which is corn sugar, fructose which is corn syrup, or sucrose, which is table sugar, especially if you don't add nutrients. If you are making just a straight sugar wash, the yeast will only be alive for like four days anyways, so it's fine to use a regular white granulated sugar if you're making something like a neutral spirit. There's no reason to spend more money and use more expensive feedstocks, but if you're going to be making a grain mash, even if you just want an unaged white liquor, and you want to add an adjunct ingredient to boost the alcohol concentration, then I would suggest using something like a dry or liquid malt extract, a malt sugar, or a malt syrup. They're all just maltose and maltose trios. It's a healthier option for the yeast. You can use just white sugar, but try to use less sugar than grain by mass. Remember to keep an eye on specific gravity as well. Then we have nutrients. Yes, technically you can get away without adding nutrients, but the yeast need those nutrients from a biological perspective and will get them from somewhere else. It may already have a small store of nutrients within the cell itself. That gets depleted pretty quickly. So they will start cannibalizing any already dead yeast, then start cannibalizing themselves. And then when some more yeast start dying, the living cells will cannibalize those dead ones as the dead cells lies, which means to uh, decompose and break open. So nutrients are pretty important as I'll come to learn. Now let's talk about why nutrients are required. 
I'm not going to go through every nutrient required. That would make this video way too long. In the previous video, I showed you how some sugars get converted, how many steps there were in the glycolytic pathway, the conversion from pyruvate into acetaldehyde and then acetaldehyde into ethanol. We're going to look at some of those processes and I'll show you how they need certain things to be present in order to exist and function. First, let's look at proteins because enzymes are proteins and they are both the machines of the cell. Proteins are made from peptides and amino acids. Peptides are just short chains of amino acids. So here we can see amino acids, 20, 21 of them in the human. Only about 20 of these show up in the yeast. Selenocysteine typically isn't in the yeast, but sometimes it is. As you can see, they all have a carbon backbone they all have various amounts of oxygen and hydrogen, which makes them organic molecules. They all have a double bonded O and a single bonded OH group at the top, which is called a carboxylic acid group, hence the acid part of amino acid. They can get all of this carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen from the feedstock water and gases dissolved in that water. But then you'll also see there's a lot of nitrogen here. The NH2 is an amino group. That's why they're called amino acids. There are also some amine groups and single nitrogens. Then on these two acids, the cysteine and methionine, you can see that there is also an S for sulfur. So right away now we know that both nitrogen and sulfur will probably be needed in larger quantities because everything that the cell does relies on proteins and enzymes and those proteins and enzymes rely on all these amino acids to be constructed in the first place. So that sulfur or nitrogen needs to be present either in the feedstock or added separately. What can happen if there isn't enough though? Well, all kinds of metabolic functions can slow down or stop altogether. For example, in the process to create this cysteine or methionine, uh, a compound called hydrogen sulfide is produced. If there isn't an available nitrogen source while these two amino acids are being produced, the yeast will just dump out that hydrogen sulfide out of the cell. Hydrogen sulfide smells like rotten eggs or farts. It doesn't smell good. This is predominantly where that smell comes from. It can dissolve in water around four to five grams per liter. So it may come out during the fermentation, but it might not come out until you start distilling. Either way, it doesn't take much for you to smell it, around 1.2 parts per billion. That's roughly 1.2 nanograms per liter or 4.5 nanograms per gallon. It's a very tiny amount. Luckily, not enough hydrogen sulfate is produced to be toxic because it's a very toxic compound. But this is simply an indicator that there is some dysfunction going on in your fermentation. And in this case, you need to add more nitrogen. Now. Yeast can only accept nitrogen in three forms. I'll, I will list them in the terms of quality to the yeast. The first source is called the free amino nitrogen, aka a fan, a free unbound amino acid or small peptide. This is the healthiest nitrogen source for yeast, but it's also relatively expensive to just add them on their own since you need 20 of them. So not a lot of people use this as a singular source. Fans will be found in grains and fruits though. Uh, also in molasses. The second source would be ammonia, NH3, an inorganic nitrogen source. Not the healthiest source, but still a great source of nitrogen for the yeast. The third source would be ammonium, NH4+, also an inorganic nitrogen source. And again, not the healthiest source, but still a great source of nitrogen for the yeast. Ammonium is commonly added as diammonium phosphate, or DAP. All three of these nitrogen sources collectively are called YAN, Y-A-N, or yeast assimilable nitrogen. Both ammonia and ammonium will simply diffuse through the cell wall and membrane of the yeast, so it doesn't need to expend energy to bring it in, like it does with free amino nitrogen. Both ammonia and ammonium will also trigger nitrogen catabolite repression, wherein if either of them are present, then the yeast won't bring in the other one or amino acids until that nitrogen source is depleted. This is why ammonia and ammonium are considered less healthy options for yeast than fans. But DAP, or diammonium phosphate, is just so cheap that it would be crazy, in my opinion, to try and use fans over diammonium phosphate on such a small scale such as ours. Nitrogen is so important that you generally want a minimum of 
one milligram of yen per gram per liter of sugar or sugar equivalent. Nitrogen is so important that you generally want a minimum of one milligram of yen per gram per liter of sugar or sugar equivalent with a total minimum of 150 milligrams per liter per wash. Optimal amounts range all over the place, so I don't feel comfortable giving a specific number, but it seems to fall between 200 and 400 milligrams per liter of wash. If you follow the one milligram per gram per liter of sugar rule of thumb, you shouldn't have any issues. In the past, I myself usually put in between 200 and 250 milligrams per liter of wash. I never went below 200 milligrams, and I never went above 250 milligrams, and I had no nitrogen related issues. So that means a minimum amount of 150 milligrams per liter for a 19 liter or five gallon wash, it would be 2.85 grams of nitrogen. But that's nitrogen. What would that be in diammonium phosphate? Well, you can head on over to Wolfram Alpha and literally just ask it, how much nitrogen is in diammonium phosphate? You will see it give you an answer in a percentage, a mass fraction, 21.2%. So then you can take that 2.85 grams, divide it by that percentage, and it will tell you how much diammonium phosphate you need to get 2.85 grams of nitrogen. In this case, it's 13.44 grams of diammonium phosphate. One tablespoon of DAP is approximately 24 grams. So half a tablespoon per five gallons or 19 liters would be the minimum to add. If you're using grains or fruit instead of sugar, you'll want the glucose equivalent. You can use a tool like VinoCalc the, I'll put the link in the description to back convert how much nitrogen you need to add. So you punch in your measured or calculated specific gravity and it will tell you the glucose sugar equivalent. You probably don't need to add any nitrogen, but sometimes in the past I would add about 25% of what was required just so I know that there's a little bit of excess nitrogen being present. A warning I like to give out though when it comes to nitrogen supplementation is stay away from products that have urea in them. Urea and ethanol in combination with heat or a copper catalyst when you're distilling can create a compound called ethyl carbamate which is a known carcinogen. Professional distilleries around the world don't use nitrogen supplements that contain urea if they're going to be supplementing nitrogen for this very reason. In Canada and most of Europe the max legal limit of ethyl carbamate is only 150 micrograms per liter for spirits, except for brandy, which can be as high as 400 micrograms per liter. In the US, there is no legal limit, but their standard voluntary limit is 125 micrograms per liter. The yeast themselves will produce urea if nitrogen is in high excess, so there's no need to add urea and risk creating higher concentrations of ethyl carbamate in the first place. So now let's look at two enzymes in specific. I'm just going to go with the pyruvate decarboxylase and alcohol dehydrogenase that we saw in the last video. These enzymes that are used at the end of the fermentation process, pyruvate decarboxylase, you can see the, the reaction of converting pyruvate into acetaldehyde. On the bottom, we have the enzyme that's uh, acting as a catalyst in this reaction, but on top we have some compounds that are called cofactors. In this case we have thiamine pyrophosphate and magnesium ions. So we can see just from this little diagram that we'll need to have thiamine present which is vitamin B1. You'll need some inorganic phosphate just so this first cofactor can be made and then we need magnesium ions present just so that this reaction can happen in the first place. Then we can look at alcohol dehydrogenase the same, turning acetaldehyde into ethanol, the enzyme name on the bottom, and then its cofactors on top. The NADH and the H plus are already going to be present, but we can also see there is a zinc ion requirement. And what this diagram doesn't show is that alcohol dehydrogenase in yeast is an iron bearing enzyme, meaning iron needs to be present as well for this enzyme to be created. So now we can add zinc and iron to the list of nutrients required. This kind of thing keeps going. Amylase enzymes for breaking down starches into simpler sugars require calcium ions to be present. Potassium and man manganese are also two vitamins that need to be present for general cell functions. Biotin, AKA vitamin B7 or B8, is a major component of the cell wall and cell membrane. So a deficiency in this vitamin can cause the yeast cell wall and membrane to be more fragile. 
Tracking down all these required nutrients isn't easy. I'm actually working on a comprehensive list of the nutrients and general ideas of why they need, might be needed. But in the meantime, you can just add multivitamins. I add two per 19 gallon or two per 19 liters or five gallons of a Centrum Adult multivitamin. I also add two of these B100 vitamins per gallon or per five gallons or 19 liters. You can also add something like a, uh, a yeast extract, like a Vegemite, a Marmite, anything that says nutritional yeast on it, or you can use the yeast from a previous wash. Collect the yeast from uh, the trub after racking over into the still, put that yeast sludge in a pot, cover them with about 25 millimeters or an inch of water, and boil it for 15 to 20 minutes. Then let it cool and store it in a sterilized jug. I use a four liter jug, so I pour the sludge in and then I fill it up to four liters. So then you'll have this broth ready for however many fermentations you can get out of it. I add about one liter of this yeast broth to any new wash I'm doing. It'll have a lot of amino acids, sterols, fatty acids, and some of those vitamins perfect for growing yeast. You can also take that trub and just boil it down until it's a paste instead and store that paste. Make sure not to burn the, uh, the sludge. You can then use uh, two tablespoons of that concentrated paste. So if you're gonna be doing a sugar wash, you can add the broth or paste at the beginning and then you can wait 20 or you know, about 24 to 48 hours and add half as much DAP as you would have originally added if you weren't using the broth or paste. If you're doing an all grain mash or fruit mash, you probably won't need to add nitrogen, but you can add some of this broth or paste if you really want to add supplemental nutrients. Yeast love it. It's because it's what they're made of and it has everything they need. So my point behind all this talking is that if you're not at an overly high gravity or low gravity, if you have the environmental conditions right at the right temperature and pH and add it in the correct nutrients in the right amounts, remembering to keep notes of what you did, then you shouldn't have any fermentation stalls. If you do, then you can check temperature, check pH, check specific gravity. If one of them is off, then you move it back into the correct range. If you're using bubbling through the airlock to determine whether or not a fermentation is still going, be mindful that leaks can form and pressurized gas will follow the path of least resistance, which might be through a leak instead of through the airlock. So here's a quick list of things to check if stalled. Check your notes check the wort temperature, check specific gravity, check wort pH with a pH meter test strip. If the specific gravity temp and pH are all fine, add a cup of that nutrient broth or a tablespoon of paste dissolved in a cup of water or add a teaspoon of DAP in a cup of water. If specific gravity is kind of high, add some water if it's possible and then recheck specific gravity. If you don't have the empty volume, you can scoop out amount of that wash and add it into another container and then pour fresh water back into the original wash and in the new container. Or you can split the original wash into two vessels and add the right amount of water to each one. Then you can check your specific gravity again. And that's it for this video on nutrients and fermentation. If there's something specific you wanna know and I didn't touch on it, I apologize. It's hard to know what specifically to talk about. So leave a comment and hopefully I can help you out. Also, if you want me to do a video on a, another specific topic, just leave a comment and we can discuss it. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. Please click like and subscribe if you want to see more. Have a great week.